Moran Surf. Moran. And in the past couple of years, I've been working on this unique research where we've been conducting studies on patients undergoing brain surgery. We would put electrodes inside their brain to figure out what problems they have, and we would keep them in the hospital for a few days while we monitor their brains, trying to see what's going on there. So the patient would be awake, sitting in bed, and there's electrodes inside his or her brain, reading his activities. And I would use this, this time to actually conduct studies with these patients. So I was looking at their brain and asking them questions. And I've been doing one particular study that came out really well, where I had patients think about things, and I was reading their thoughts using these electrodes and projecting them on the screen in front of them. And this was a remarkable work. And when you conduct a study that works well, you want to publish it somewhere. And the way science works is you write it up in a paper, and you send it out to one of many journals out there, where it's being refereed by a few people, and if they cannot find any flaws in your work, it gets published. And there's many journals out there, and they kind of vary in how hard is it to get your work out there. The most prestigious journal out there in science is called Nature. Nature is where you publish your work if you really think you're going to change the world. To give you an example, this is where they published the discovery of the neutron, the, the, neg the neutral particle in the atom. This is where they published the discovery of the ability to clone the sheep dolly. They discovered pulsars and they put it there. DNA was published there. So really remarkable works gets published in Nature. So when I felt that my work is really remarkable, I sent it to Nature. And six months later, I got this letter that says, congratulations, we're going to publish your work. This is great. This is something that happens in a scientist's career zero to one times, pretty much. <laughs> and, and I was very happy with that. And so I started kind of working towards the publication. And the way it works with Nature is that they give you a date that the paper is going to come out, where they're going to have a press release letting everyone know about your work. And my date was October 28. And you have about three or four weeks before this date up to which you can talk about your work to other journalists and media and press, letting them know what, come out, what comes out, but no one can publish anything because there's an embargo. And the embargo gets lifted on October 28th at 1 p.m. New York time, and that's when everyone in the world is going to know about my glory. So I had four weeks talking to the media, talking to the press, explaining what's going to come out with my work. They were ecstatic. I got phone calls from all over the world explaining what's going to come out. Journalists were very happy with that. And even Nature realized that from the barrage of, of information that kind of people ask about our work, there's going to be a lot of interest in the, in the kind of public about that. So we had this idea to make a short movie where we're going to explain my work to the world in a kind of a clear way, not just the paper, but something very, very simple. Something that's going to come out and with the kind of lift of the embargo, there's going to be a clip on Nature's website where everyone gets to understand what we're doing. And I volunteered to make this movie myself. So I interviewed the neurosurgeon in our team, my former PhD advisor. I, too, was explaining the results in a very clear way. We had a nice footage of the patient thinking about things, and his thoughts were on the screen. Beautiful movie. And I edited the movie up to the very last moment, up to the very morning where I was going to kind of have the paper come out. And to end the movie in an uplifting, nice message, I had the neurosurgeon on team speak about the future. What can you do with this work? And, he, and the movie ends with him saying something, connecting brains to machines can be the first step in reading people's thoughts, intentions, memories, and even dreams fade out. This was a beautiful movie. <laughs> and I finished working on it after kind of editing it all night long at 8 AM that morning, October 28. And then I had five more hours before everyone is going to know about my work. I was exhausted from working all night, so I went to sleep. I said, I have five more hours. I'm going like, to rest a little bit. I put my phone on vibrate so it wouldn't wake me up, and I had like, a buzzer to wake me up at 1 PM to see how everything is kind of coming out. But I didn't wake up at 1. I woke up an hour before, because my phone kept vibrating the entire time. When I woke up kind of dizzy, looking at my phone, there were hundreds of missed calls. My voicemail was full, and there was a kind of a ring from somewhere in England. And I picked up the phone, and this was the BBC senior producer. He said, Dr. Surf, I'm so glad I got you. I want to put you on the nightly news. I want to open with, your seg with the segment with, with talking about your dream recording machine. 
I said, what is that? And I, I didn't know what he said. I've seen the movies that you made, and I've seen the end where you talk about the, 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 the remake coding thing, and this is a great thing, and, and we want to open with that. And I realized that, that this is wrong, and I say, well, you, you get the idea wrong. This is not what we do. It's something else. He said, I don't understand. Is it something that you can do? Can you record dreams? And I said, no, it's not at all what we did. He said, but is it possible? I said, well, it's possible. Thank you, too. <laughs> the phone gets hang up, and, and now I have like a few more minutes to, to, to try to deal with that. I don't know what's going on. And then it's 1 p.m., and I refresh the browser, and the first thing that you see is Nature's headline, scientists at Caltech have been uh, projecting thoughts on a screen. Accurate. But the next thing is the BBC headline saying, scientists say that recording dreams is possible. Not at all what we did, to be clear. The word dream doesn't appear in the paper. We never did it. It's not possible in any way from what we did. But this was the headline in BBC News. And on CNN five minutes later. <laughs> and on MSNBC, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. The story gets bigger and bigger with every headline. People kind of start copying it and, and, and escalating. So first it says dream recording is possible. Then it's been, done for, it's been done for five years. Scientists have been recording our dreams. They've been copying it and keeping it in databases. The CIA is behind this thing, and they're recording our dreams for a while now. The story gets bigger and bigger. And there's no way to stop it. I start getting phone calls and emails from people all over the world asking about this DRM, the dream recording machine, about the pricing, about how can, it, how can they buy it, how can they work with it. And I try to explain one by one to people that it doesn't exist and it's a mistake, but you know, no one listens. This is a beautiful story. It keeps growing bigger and bigger, and there's no way to stop it. And I get really frustrated because this should have been my glorious days, and instead it turns into an awful thing. And I call my father, who's a journalist, and I ask him, Dad, how can I kill this story? What's the secret that you journalists know? And he says, the secret is to turn off your phone, don't answer any calls, wait 24 hours. No one cares about science. It's going to die by its end. It's <laughs> and so I do just that. I turn off my phone, and I wait. 24 hours later, number one story, MSNBC, CNN, Wall Street Journal, New York, everywhere is our story. Everyone in the world talks about that. Because my phone is off, I start getting emails from people who find me, sending me their dreams to interpret, asking me questions about their dream. <laughs> Husband tell me that they want to read their wife's uh, dreams. Uh, uh, a famous chef in England says that he's been dreaming this recipe, but he can't remember the ingredients, and he wants me to put electrodes in his brain and get the, 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 the recipe out. <laughs> I get phone calls from people all over the world asking me questions about dreams. People ask me to come to hearings in the, in, in the, the house to talk about the fact that the CIA has been using me to record their dreams, <laughs> and there's no way to kill this story. And I get really, really upset. And I sit at my home, and I find no way to end this thing. And my friends see me kind of not happy. And now it's two days later. Story is still number one all over the news. It didn't die, like my dad says. But my friends say, you know, it's October 30. It's Halloween. Why don't you go out with us? Have fun. Relax. Forget about this thing. Just go out and have a good time. And I say, yeah, it's a good idea. You should do that. And I should dress up like something. And in a self-deprecating sense of humor, I decide to dress up like Sigmund Freud. <laughs> I put a little beard and a pipe, and I comb my hair to the side, and I put little glasses, and I go out with my friends, and it's a great evening. We go out, we wander the streets, I have a nice costume, people take pictures, they upload them to the internet, and the day after, if you look for me, not only do you find the dream recording machine and stories about it, but you also see a picture of me looking up like Sigmund Freud. <laughs> so now there's a picture worth a thousand words that kind of explains the story that I actually am the dream interpreter. <laughs> and the story just escalates more. No way to kill it. My dad was totally wrong. And I tell myself, well, what is the way to end it? And I look at the news, and I see something must end it. And I see that in three days, November 3rd, there's going to be midterm elections in the US. Surely this is going to kill my story. But they say that the Republicans are going to take over. This is a big story. It's going to kill, and it's going to trump my story. So I wait three more days. In the meantime, I get calls from Apple asking me to buy this machine. They want to kind of option it. When I said it doesn't exist, they said, fine, you want to keep it a secret? We understand. Just let us option it. Let us be the first to buy it when you actually come out with this thing. And I get more and more phone calls from people asking me questions about that. And November 3rd, midterm elections in the US. In the US, indeed, the story changes hands. Now it's, everyone talks about that. But all over the world, still, the dream recording machine is the number one story. Everyone wants to know about that. And I find no way to end it. After a few days, finally, the story kind of gradually died. When Prince William proposed to his wife, this is apparently more important, and I was kind of feeling relaxed when I got the phone call. I was sitting in my office, and the phone rang. I picked up the phone, and there was this woman there, and she said, hi, Dr. Surf, I want to put you on the phone with Chris, and I wait a second, and on the phone is Christopher Nolan, the guy who made Inception that very same year. 
And in a British accent, he says to me, Dr. Surf, I look at your work, and we're gonna come out with a DVD for Inception in a few days, and I want you to be the face of Inception. I want you to go on a tour with me and all the crew and the team of, of Inception and explain how Inception is actually true and you can do that. <laughs> and this is very tempting. This is like uh, my Hollywood career. I was in Los Angeles. This seems like a great idea to go and do with one caveat. This is not what I do and it's not true. And I explained to him. <laughs> I say, you know, there's one problem. This is not true. This story is not right. And he says, why don't you send me the paper? He was the first guy to ask me that. And I send him the paper. And we speak 24 hours later. And he says, you know, I read the paper. The first guy to do that. And you're right. It's really not about dreams. But I don't really care. <laughs> you are now the person who kind of embodies the recording. Everyone looks at you and thinks that you can do that. You can still go on tour with me and explain how it's done. No one really cares about science. You can just do whatever you want. Like, people can understand it, whatever you say. And I ask for 24 more hours to think about that, where I really kind of contemplate the benefits of going on a tour with Inception and being the face of this thing counter to my scientific career of many years. <laughs> and after 24 hours, when we talk again, I explain that while this is very tempting, I'm going to have to say no and choose science after all. It's not the end. They're working on Inception too, and I'm working on nature too. So there's time for that. Thank you. Moran, sir.